are calcium supplements really the secret to stronger bones or could they be doing more harm than they are good? If you've ever stood in the vitamin aisle wondering whether to grab the giant bottle of calcium, this video is for you. Hello my friends, I'm Sarah and I'm a nutritional health coach through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. I'm also a BoneFit certified fitness instructor and a 500 hour trained yoga teacher with additional training that's specific to osteoporosis and yoga. I'm on a mission to reduce the number of fractures that happen every year and I am so pleased to have you join me in the journey to better bone health. Today we're diving into one of the biggest questions when it comes to bone health. Do you actually need calcium supplements? So we'll look at what the latest science has to say, what the real risks and benefits are, and how to know if supplements or food are the right choice for you. By the end of this video, you'll have a clear and evidence-based answer so that you can make the best decision for your bones and your overall health. So here's something that you might not know. Different countries actually recommend very different daily calcium intakes. In the United States, the guidelines are often much higher than in places like the UK or parts of Asia. Yet those populations don't necessarily have weaker bones. So why the big difference? And what does it actually mean for you? Let's take a closer look at how different countries set their daily calcium intake goals and why they don't all agree. So in the United States, the National Institutes of Health recommends taking 1200 milligrams of calcium daily for women over 50 and for men over the age of 70. In the United Kingdom, the NHS only recommends taking 700 milligrams for all adults, which is significantly less than the US recommendation. Historically, Japan recommends somewhere between 650 and 700 milligrams of calcium per day. Nordic countries, including Sweden and Finland, often recommend 800 milligrams of daily calcium intake, while the World Health Organization, also known as the WHO, suggests intake that's somewhere between 500 and 1,000 milligrams of calcium intake per day based on a person's individual needs and also the region where they live. So who's right or is anybody right? Think of it like this. The recommendations reflect real life in each place. It also reflects what people typically eat, their fracture patterns and how public health teams balance easy to hit goals with what's good enough for bone health. Add in bioavailability. Bioavailability is how well your body actually absorbs calcium. And then you can see why a single global number doesn't exist. In countries like the US, diet is assumed to include a mixture of fortified foods and dairy. In Japan and parts of Asia, lower dairy intake is balanced with high consumption of calcium rich plant-based foods, fish with bones, and soy products, which can additionally support bone through having isoflavones. Public health philosophies differ from country to country. The US tends to recommend a higher level to ensure that no one falls short, while the UK and the WHO often set recommendations closer to the minimum required for bone health, assuming that balanced diets can meet the requirements often without supplementation. So bioavailability also has a contributing role in how much calcium we actually need. Bioavailability refers to how much calcium is actually available to our bodies from various food sources, and it isn't all the same. So for example, spinach has a really high amount of calcium in it, but the calcium is not bioavailable because of its high oxalate content. This means that we shouldn't just be focusing on whether we hit a particular number of milligrams for our calcium intake, but rather we should be considering and looking at our overall diet and our lifestyle. Are the foods that we eat providing bioavailable calcium? So 
If your primary sources for calcium come from food sources that are high in oxalates, you may need to adjust how you prepare these foods to make the calcium more bioavailable for your body to absorb. Oxalates are natural compounds in plants that can bind to calcium in the digestive tract that make it harder for your body to absorb. For example, spinach looks amazing on paper. It's high in calcium, but your body only absorbs about 5% of it because most of the calcium is locked up by oxalates. On the other hand, low oxalate greens like kale, bok choy, and broccoli offer calcium that your body can absorb much more efficiently. This is actually closer to between 40 and 60%. That's actually higher than a lot of dairy products. So if your diet leans heavily on high oxalate foods, then yes, you may need to be really intentional about adding in some low oxalate calcium foods or a mix of sources to make sure that your body is actually getting what it needs. This might also require supplementation, just something to keep in mind. This may mean that you have to aim for the higher end of calcium intake, even with supplementation. Conditions like celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, or having low stomach acid can also reduce absorption, meaning that you might also need to aim a little bit higher. Vitamin D status is critical here. Without having enough vitamin D, your body can't absorb calcium efficiently, no matter how much calcium you actually take in. So when you're figuring out how much calcium you should actually aim for personally, it's important to consider your bone health status. If you've already been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, it's likely that your body will benefit from being at the higher end of calcium intake. But keep in mind that there's still a balancing act and mega dosing can also cause problems. So let's have a look at what the science shows when it comes to calcium supplementation and for bone health. So in the largest randomized trial that we have in postmenopausal women, and this is the Women's Health Initiative, taking 1000 milligrams per day of calcium as calcium carbonate specifically, plus having 400 international units of vitamin D led to a 17% higher risk of having kidney stones compared with having a placebo over a seven year time period. This doesn't mean that everyone gets kidney stones, but it's something important to be aware of. So if you find yourself needing to supplement calcium and you also need to lower your risk for developing kidney stones, here are a few things that you can do to help you to mitigate the risk of developing kidney stones. So first off, don't take a large amount of calcium at one time. Our bodies can only absorb a max of between 500 and 600 milligrams of calcium at one time. It's important to break this amount up. Split your doses up. If you need to take part of your calcium earlier in the day and part of it later, that is totally okay. Take your calcium supplement with a meal so that the calcium binds to dietary oxalate in your gut rather than being absorbed and later becoming concentrated in your urine. Make sure that you're also getting a good amount of vitamin D3 for yourself to help regulate your calcium and to increase how well it's absorbed by your body. Also keep in mind that most kidney stones start when your urine gets too concentrated, which means that hydration is a really simple way to help fix things. Hydration dilutes the stone formers like calcium and oxalate so that the crystals don't clump. It also flushes tiny crystals out before they grow. <laughs> so you could also try adding some lemon or some lime to your water and that Additional citrate is a natural crystal blocker that also helps to bind to the calcium. So it's also important to talk about heart health when we talk about calcium supplementation. There are some studies that have picked up a small increase in heart attack risk when people take calcium supplements by themselves. So this means that the calcium is not paired with either vitamin D or with K2. But there's newer analysis, some including some metadata, that bundles lots of randomized trials together that don't see a clear rise in heart disease, stroke, or death. So in other words, the science here is mixed. So what do we do with that? 
If you find yourself needing to supplement calcium, make sure that you're also working to supplement the right amount of vitamin D3 for your body and your personal situation. Check with the doctor to figure out what that is. It may also be helpful to take a vitamin K2 supplement, but know that this may not be appropriate if you have to take a blood thinner. It's important to talk to your doctor or your pharmacist about supplementing vitamin K2 if you're taking a blood thinner. It's also important to make sure that you don't take too large of a calcium dose at any one time. Our bodies can only absorb a max of between 500 and 600 milligrams. So that's the second time you've heard me say that today. It's important. Another important consideration when taking calcium supplements is that they can interact with a number of medications, including some antibiotics, thyroid medications, and bisphosphonates. If you're taking a medication to slow bone loss, pay attention to that. This makes the timing of when you take your calcium supplement really important. You need to space your calcium supplement out on average about two hours from any of these medications. So if you need to supplement calcium, it's likely that you're wondering what the best form of calcium to take is. Calcium carbonate is the least expensive and it's also the most readily available form. If you're consuming foods that have been fortified with calcium, it's likely that you're getting calcium carbonate in the fortified food. If you need to supplement calcium, getting calcium carbonate is better than not having enough calcium. So, you know, Keep that in mind with what I'm about to say. But if you have another option like calcium citrate, I would personally choose another option. The reason why is that calcium carbonate, while it's a, an abundant form of calcium, it's also the least well absorbed form. So this matters when you're looking at supplementation. Calcium carbonate can also cause digestive issues and digestive discomfort. So if calcium carbonate is your only option, then consuming it with other food can help to limit the digestive issues. I personally prefer calcium citrate as a supplement option. This is because it's well absorbed with or without food and it doesn't tend to cause digestive discomfort or any other issues with your digestive system. This is the preferred form to use if you have low stomach acid or if you take an acid reducing medication. Calcium citrate is slightly more expensive than calcium carbonate, but it's still largely accessible and its price point combined with how much easier it is for the body to absorb is why I usually suggest this particular form for a calcium supplement. We can't really have a discussion about calcium supplements without talking about algae-based calcium supplements. So algae-based calcium is made from a calcified red sea algae. It's essentially a natural matrix of calcium plus magnesium and some trace minerals that are baked right into the plant's skeleton. So instead of a single ingredient, you're getting a multi-mineral bundle. And that's why labels often brag about it having 72 trace minerals. Since they are a natural supplement, they also tend to be more expensive than either calcium carbonate or calcium citrate. Most algae calcium research so far has been small and also manufacturer funded. There aren't yet large randomized trials that show superior fracture reduction coming from algae based supplements. That said, what the small amount of research that has been done shows is that this form of calcium has good bioavailability, which makes it a really promising possibility. I'm hoping that more research is coming. So since it's coming from a sea plant, there's the potential for it to have heavy metal contamination, which is also something to keep in mind. This makes the quality of your supplement really matter. Make sure if you choose to go with an algae-based supplement that you choose one that's third-party certified to make sure that it doesn't have heavy metal contamination. There's also another form of calcium that's less frequently discussed that's also a good option for some people and that's calcium hydroxyapatite. Calcium hydroxyapatite is basically bone-like mineral in capsule form. So most hydroxyapatite supplements are made from bovine bone and they include calcium with phosphorus in a ratio that's similar to real bone, 
plus it has a little bit of protein matrix. So in theory, that whole bone package works more naturally for your body than taking plain calcium salts, salt supplements would. So this is similar to taking the form of vitamin D3 for our bodies instead of taking vitamin D2. D3 is the form that our bodies use, so it's the ideal form of vitamin D to supplement with. With calcium hydroxyapatite, there are some randomized trials and also a couple of meta-analyses that show that hydroxyapatite can improve short-term calcium handling and help to maintain bone density at least as well, and in some cases better than other forms of calcium supplements. So most of these studies looked at bone density and bone turnover markers. They didn't look at fractures, so keep that in mind. So the translation of this is that the form of calcium also looks promising, but big independent trials that track actual fracture risk are still thin. So calcium hydroxyapatite tends to be more expensive and it's also animal based. So if you're not eating animal products, then this particular supplement is not plant-based, which is something to keep in mind. My general framework for getting enough daily calcium is to start with food first. Work to consume a diet that's high in calcium rich foods that align with your needs and food values. Track your calcium foods for about a week to see how much calcium you're consuming on average. And then from there, figure out what your daily calcium intake goal is. My personal take on this is that if you're able to get calcium from food, I would err on the side of going with the food and the US guidelines because it provides a cushion for various bioavailability in different calcium rich foods. The next step in this calcium framework is then to fill in your gaps. So if you have any, which you may or may not, then it's time to look at supplements. Choose the best available form that fits into your budget and your lifestyle. Make sure that you're timing when you take your calcium supplement with any other medications that you're taking. Calcium supplements can interact with osteoporosis medication, thyroid medication, certain antibiotics, cancer medications, diuretics, and other supplements that include iron, zinc, and potentially magnesium. This is the second time through looking at how medication interacts. It's important. <laughs> when it's the second time through, it's important. So the general rule of thumb is to take your calcium supplement two hours away from other medications and the supplements that they can interact with. If you take a thyroid medication, calcium supplements should be taken four hours away from a thyroid medication. So it's also important to make sure that you're getting enough D3. This is the third or fourth time through with the D3. It's really important. And also to make sure that you can only take K2 if you're not taking a blood thinner. So those are all important things to consider when you're looking at supplementing calcium. So back to our question of do you really need a calcium supplement? Maybe, but only if your food isn't quite getting you there. If you remember one thing from today, make it this, food, calcium rich foods come first, then fill in the gap smartly. Build most of your calcium from meals that you enjoy. And then if you're still coming up short, choose a form that fits in your body and your budget. Keep the doses small. Eat your calcium supplement at mealtime. Stay on top of your vitamin D. Hydrate and give your medications some space. So when it comes to calcium and medication, keep in mind that when in doubt, two hours out. That's the calm evidence-based path to having stronger bones without having unnecessary risks that can come from supplementing calcium. So the next step is really simple. Track one normal day of eating, tally your calcium and see where you land. I put a quick tally sheet and all the studies that we talked about in the description for you. And if you find this video helpful, please share it with someone that you know and love who can also benefit from this information. And tell me in the comments, what's one calcium rich food that you're gonna add to your diet this week? Is it kale, tofu, sardines, fortified milk? And on that note, I look forward to seeing you in the next video.